A man's view of the world may be so individual as to set him apart. Here in this substantial North London house lives, in a degree of security and comfort, a man who is obsessed by poverty and suffering, a highly sociable recluse, a compulsive writer who in his most personal work can't make himself understood, a professional clown desperate to be taken seriously. Spike Milligan watched with me a preview of his own obituary. Seven, six, five years, four years, three of them about, about to be born. Right. And then he died 1985. I um, love that bit. I wonder where I'd been the last year. Spike Milligan was not so much a personality as a constellation of anarchic ideas. Do you play requests? Well, it all depends if I know it, wouldn't it? You know, Irish eyes are smiling. Oh, yeah. Do you write? He made his living as a funny man, writer and performer, but during his last years he wished to be thought of, above all, as a caring man. His perspectives on society, politics and religion were fragmented and inconsistent. Piecing the artistry and beliefs of Spike Milligan into a rounded portrait isn't easy, but to begin at the beginning. He was born Terence Milligan in the Indian province of Bombay in April 1918. His Irish father was a sergeant in the army, and the family enjoyed the lifestyle associated with those dying days of empire. Brought up as a devout Roman Catholic, Terence was a happy and successful pupil at his school in Pune. His conduct was good, and although his application was only fair, he came top of his class. His boyhood in India always remained a golden memory for him, but it was brought to a sudden end when, in 1933, cuts in the army budgets forced his father to retire. The Milligan family, with younger brother Desmond, sailed home. Terence was then 15. Boyhood in India was a poor preparation for England in the 1930s. London in the Depression was grey and unwelcoming. The Milligans had to swap their veranda bungalow in Pune for two rented attic rooms in Lewisham. The teenage Spike found the transition particularly hard to cope with, and later in life always called this his grey period. But with the outbreak of the Second World War, he was called up to join the 19th Royal Heavy Artillery. He entered into the war efforts with a boy's own gusto. Nearly 30 years after the war ended, he was still meeting old army pals, reliving shared experiences. He seems to have felt, to the end of his life, that his days in the army were his happiest. The only autobiography he's left us chronicles his army experiences in three volumes. Perhaps ironic in a man who died a pacifist. He'd started writing in the army, but it wasn't until the 1950s, when the riotous humour of the goons became a cult, that Milligan grew into a national figure. 1939. 1940. 1941. 49 BC. Ow! 1941. 1941. Any advance on 41? There was no advance in 41. The war was a veritable stalemate. Was it, mate? Yes, mate. <laughs> By the end of the show's ten-year run on the BBC Home Service, Spike Milligan had had his first nervous breakdown. But the goons kept going and the anarchic humour they projected every Tuesday night in the 1950s proved so durable that leading members of the establishment declared themselves fans a generation later and made a point of attending Milligan's performances on stage. He was a guest at the royal wedding in 1981. The Milligan humour transferred to television and again broke new ground. But his clowning there never quite attracted the strong cult loyalties of the goons, although he relished being seen as well as heard. And the Lord said unto all men, Always wear clean underwear. <laughs> and the Pharisees say, Why far thereof to which? And he said, Because, supposing thou art knock it down in the street, <laughs> blessed are they, that wear it clean knickers. <laughs> or even though they be knocked down in the street by a bus, verily, they will be pure of heart from the waist down. <laughs> uh, heart? 
<laughs> this is convict Thrill, who was in for feeling bicycle saddles. He prospered as writer and performer in both television and film. Up and out! <laughs> but Milligan never disguised the anguish that his talent brought him. He was diagnosed and treated for most of his adult life as a manic depressive. You can Come see and look at this. Like many clowns, he was desperate to be taken seriously. In his last years, he put his reputation to use campaigning against smoking and pollution and for vegetarianism, endangered species and nuclear disarmament. In pursuit of these causes, he sometimes puzzled his audience by an earnestness which appeared obsessive. It'd be the same. And this became in England, extinct in this country about 300 years ago. Yes. Well, I hope some rich person will look at this and might say, send him £100,000, help the animal world. <laughs> Really is worth it. If I had it, I'd give you some. In fact, I think I'll do a concert for you, Greg. Okay. I would like to do a concert at the Mermaid. Okay. But Milligan the conservationist never quite won the popular following of Milligan the clown. There's always a suspicion that a preoccupation with the welfare of animals masks an incapacity to get on with people. And this exhibitionist, who was also a very private person, seemed at the end to have been gifted with a creative lunacy which may have unbalanced him in his dealings with the world as it is. Was there any, anything left out of that outfit that you think is important? Anything that you've done that's important to you that wasn't there? No, it was a mini obit, as mm. you say, Peter. And in the time given it, it was a pretty fair assessment of what I'm about. Mm -hmm. That's about 67. <laughs> that's what I'm about at the moment. Mm. Yes, and I was interested in the in, in dispersal. It's very strange for me to see it, because I had no idea what to expect of this programme. Suddenly see the interdispersal of me being serious and then standing with a tuber in front of a raging sea saying something. I thought, my God, people must think I'm bloody mad. If I, that's the sort of thing I'm doing, that pianist with the 20 hands and all that. And said, well, it's a lot of fun. I must have given people a lot of fun because it made me suddenly laugh, having forgotten what it was all about. And I'd forgotten all the little serious bits you'd interspersed. I mean, going around Graham Dangerfield's little wildlife park where he was trying to save uh, things like minic foxes and things like that. And, uh, yes, I think it was a fair assessment of what I'm about. One it's thing that's puzzled us in making it is when you had these, these breakdowns that you had... I call was the it, AA. Was, was, <laughs> was it because of the pressure of work? In other words, was it simply the fact that you were the sole scriptwriter for a long time? Yes. Or was it the nature of the work? Was it the fact that you were writing scripts which were in themselves uh, manic? It was twofold. The scripts were manic because I was getting manic. Hmm. Uh, the pressure of work was unbelievable. I was having, uh, not having marital problems, but my wife was about to have a baby, and she had difficult labour, and then she had postnatal fever, and she was in the house, and I was trying to feed the baby and write the goon show, which in itself was a bit of a goon show, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Taking the wife's temperature, feeding the child. Then I got a, a New Zealand nurse in, and uh, I, I started to cry sometimes because of the pressure of work. And she called in a doctor and said, this man should be removed from the house, he's an alcoholic. So I've always been in love with New Zealand ever since then. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the things. And then yeah, they took me away eventually. They took me away, Peter, to a home where there was much understanding after watching The Cuckoo's Nest. And so I did that long before The Cuckoo's Nest came out. We used to go take a 20 of us and try and get into the toilet, all of us, all us lunatics, and they'd try and get us out. I used to lead them in the toilet and we were trying to break the world record for dysentery in this toilet. They said, come on out now, come on out now. And they said, no, we can't. Pass the food under the door. Like this. There was all some kind of re resentment of the way they were treating us. They were treating us as lunatics and we weren't. We were sick, normal people. That's mm -hmm. a great difference. A loony is somebody who never comes out of it. What sort of treatment did you have? Uh, they gave me sodium amytol, which sort of just masks you out. That's all. You, you turn into a into a, a troglodyte almost, you know. You live in the, in the cave in your mind. And as you come to, they'd wake you up and give you some more like this. And of course you had the right to say no to it, so sometimes I was saying no, but sometimes I felt so lost that I would take it because it was like taking some kind of stimulant, you sort of zonk out. 
Mind you, the kids take it like chewing all and things these days. They take mm. it as a, you take it and stay awake. That's the kick, mm. as I discovered later. I How long were you in there for? I was in there, well, I, I went about five times. Mm. I was in there for about three months the first time. That was the longest I was ever in. Was it? They ran uh, out of medicine. I ran out of lunacy, <laughs> a mutual agreement. You know. I've often wondered if, if, if you've got a, a view of reality, which isn't like everybody else's, and if you hold to it firmly enough, can you be quite happy in that view of reality, even though it, it might be insane? Well, no. If you have a, a vision beyond the vision of normal people, I don't know if I... I think maybe I have. Like Paul Clay, you, you draw a different type of picture. Uh, you suddenly move out of the ordinary scene and nobody understands Paul Clay's paintings. They realise that they are, they are manufactured by a man with a tremendous painting talent and he has to put a caption on the bottom uh, to explain what it is, like it's the fisherman or the man on a whale, things like that. But he certainly has a different vision and he has the talent of a classical painter to put it together but he has to do this different thing. Uh, I suppose I still write in that... When I really write comedy, Nobody understands it. It's like Finnegan's Wake. I have to gear myself to write my like war memoirs in the same parlance that the people will understand. The sort of the patois of the intelligence that is currently active in the, in the human in the human psyche. Is this vision that you have still a, a reality for you? Yes, I can see that we're going to. I'm not concerned for myself. I've made it, as you can see. I've got enough money. I've got enough food, and my lifetime will be lived out in reasonable comfort. But I'm very worried about the great, 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 great grandchildren of, of what's going to come. I'm very worried about that. And I'm certain they're going to come up against a very sticky situation in regards to the Earth's resources because of the sheer reproduction rate of ourselves. Mm. Are you glad you had your own children? Yes, and I had... I realise now that I had too many. Nobody advised me. I had four children. Well, I could have just done with two. The Earth's resources would have been that much less under pressure. You understand what I mean? I do, but it sounds a bit unbalanced. The, your two oh, that's not the most unbalanced statement. That's the most balanced statement I'll ever make. Your two but children are not going to affect the Earth's resources very seriously, are they? Of course they eat it. They, every one they have a breakfast. They take it in. They use the lighting, the heating, petrol, everything. They're eating up the Earth's resources. Of course they are, Peter. Say yes, otherwise you're persona non grata. Well, I'm going to have to be that because I'm, <laughs> no, I'm worried. Uh, it's a matter of balance here, isn't it? It's a matter of perspective. Well, the amount of electricity that your children will use in this house is not going to seriously affect uh, the future of our nation. Every it? little turn. Listen, it's the last straw that breaks the camel's back. And who's mm. to know when that's going to be laid on, right? But you, your children are important to you. Oh, when, well, if I hadn't have had kids, I think I'd have been a bum laying on some beep in Pembrokeshire now drawing the dole and just having a couple of beers at night with the lads, going to see a game of football, one, one, one suit. Mm. That's, that's the kind of guy I've been. They gave me the incentive to, to provide for them. But how would you say you got on? Would you, would you think like that most... Marvellous. If anybody said to me, what's your greatest success in life? I said, my kids still love me. Mm. I'd say that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. What's your greatest failure? My greatest failure? Um, that I didn't hold my first marriage together. I was a Catholic and that's always haunted me that I was really responsible for the break up of the marriage because I was going out of my mind. And that, that always haunted me. That, that's hurt me, really hurt me. But if you were going out of your mind, you weren't really responsible, were you? Not really, but the poor woman was not to know. She wasn't a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse to understand it. I was being abominable to her, you know, outrageous, sometimes threatening violence and things like that. Were you drinking then? No, no, just the sheer tension of the work I was working under. Mm. You said just then you were a Catholic. So yeah, the so past still am, oh, you're always, always a Catholic. You're always a bad one, though. All Catholics are bad Catholics. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, but it was jolly good religion. Uh, I met some very happy people in it, and the Jesuits, who I helped bring me up, were jolly good. But is it still important to you? Well, it's like the geese and that follow the guy who broke the eggs open. The first thing they ever saw they thought was their mother. Well, so my only religious experience is the Catholic Church. Although I have delved into the Jewish religion, which I find is a delightful religion. Do you ever pray? Sometimes. 
sometimes in desperation, I say, if there's a God out there, for God's sake, do something about this, would you? But I always feel that I'm talking to a void. But it's just to the off chance there might be somebody listening. Do you go to Mass? No, I've been to Mass for a long time. Oh, Jesus, isn't that terrible? No. But I have a priest who blesses me every now and then, and he comes to the house here and talks, which is very lovely. Do you think you'll ever go back to I, be a, a, a Catholic? I am a Catholic, you know. I'm just not a very good churchgoer, that's all. What would you change in your life if you could uh, turn a knob and make something different? If I could change my life, I'd like to have had a, a better education. I'd like to have had a better education. I'd like to have gone to the Royal College of Music and studied uh, harmony and counterpoint. And I'd like to have gone to the Slade School or the Royal Academy of Art and studied painting. Those are the things I would like to have done, but I haven't. It would, is this to satisfy yourself, or is it to well, enable you talent. to express the vision that you've I got? I have an unreleased talent in music, which I can't get out because I haven't got this knowledge of counterpoint and, uh, and uh, harmony and passing, har passing chords and things like that. I don't know. I can write tunes. Uh, and I can paint. I've even had a painting exhibit at the Royal Academy. But I, I'm not that fluent painter that I'd like to be, the one that wants to come out. But it's too late now, I'm afraid. You know. Why? Because I'm concentrating most of my living on, as a writer. And that takes up quite a lot of my time. I just have it in me to write, you know. It's just like a, a racehorse has to run. You know, without it, there's, there's no point to it. Do you think comedy has to be destructive in the sense that you, you're, you're laughing at people or at situations or at ideas? Well, I like to put people on. I like to put people on and say, um, so I always give this ex my best example, like, you walk into the middle of a television screen and you say, <clears throat> this looks like a good place for it, don't you think? Say, yes, let's do it here then, right. And they, they put a couple of dog collars on, the vicar's collars, and then you pull stocking marsh over your head and then you walk over to a man and say, excuse me, knock on an invisible door. The chap says, yes, and you say, you say who are you? He said, we are, we are Jehovah burglars. <laughs> and he says, what are you, what are you, we're seeking refuge for our beliefs. And he says, what are your beliefs? He said, we believe you've got a lot of money in the house. <laughs> now, that sort of compulsive madness. Mm -hmm. you know. Do you dream these up or do they just come? I, no, you have to sit and work at it, you know. You, what, in a darkened room? Well, no, no, no you just like, like, you get one of your mates, like John Antrobus is one of my favourite writing mates. We sit together and suddenly uh, we start to laugh. We start to laugh at general things like how he came here on, when he came here on the tube, the chap was singing the, the national anthem. Early morning tube, crowded train, packed out, he's singing, God save our gracious queen, and went on singing it. And he, when he got off here at High Barnet, he got out of the train and went on singing this God save the queen up the road. And he thought, who is this man? What's he all about? I mean, and when he told me that, that set us off for the day. <laughs> I'm a bit puzzled, Spike, as to why the autobiographical stuff you've chosen to write all seems to have focused on the army, which in fact was a fairly small, in terms of, of years, period of your career, and certainly not the one that you're best known for. Why is that? Well, I think it was the most explosive part of my life. I've lived a reasonably sort of sheltered Catholic life, going to Mass every Sunday and all this, not swearing. I remember, damn it, was my worst swear word. I never smoked, and I didn't drink. And suddenly, that all changed. Oh, it was goodbye to Mars bars. Suddenly, these dreadful, hairy men were in rooms, were belching and letting off and swearing and talking about their female conquest. I didn't have to give it to her and she had big boobs go, oh, I had her knickers down. And I used to lay in bed terrified that something would go wrong. You know, I thought, surely Hitler must win this war. He can't let these men win. But this, and, uh, as I got to love them, these men, and I did, I got to love every part of them, you know, all, even the worst of even the scoundrels I loved, you know right up to the colonels, they were all... With a person like me who has an all-surveying eye, it was absolute, uh, absolute wealth of material that I just could not lose. And of course, the first instance I got, 
uh, to write it. I'd had kept a diary as well, of course, and documents and all those photographs. You notice that in my books have lavish numbers of photographs to prove back up what I'm saying. And uh, consequently, I just couldn't, could not resist writing about th my experiences in the army. Are you not at all worried that boys today reading those books will say, the army's a great place, Spike Milligan had a great time there, um, you know, let's have another war? Um, well, I should hate to be responsible for World War Three, but it certainly would be a, a good label, you know. Spike Milligan said of World War Three, uh, that would get on television. I'd be famous then. If you read all the books, you realize how I ended up uh, in a psychiatric ward, wounded. So it was not a very good ending. But there, are, there were moments mm. in it which were very, very funny. Did it? Did did the experience damage you in any way? The yes. Army when I went in the army, it it left me scarred. It did. Yes. I was different. I started to get stammering. Uh, started stammering and crying, and this lasted for about seven years. If anything went bang, I'd jump out of my skin. I still do. Still do jump as a bang, you know. Still can't stand noise. We said in, in, in the um, obit that it was odd for a pacifist to write these memoirs. Is that an accurate description of Well, you? I wasn't a pacifist at all, you know. No, I, but now? Uh, I'm a, I'm a You see, I cannot totally take on the mantle of a pacifist. If you do, you must be total and accept Russia coming here and dominating our country and having been there and having been doing the Hungarian Revolution, having been there for three days in Budapest and seeing the, f the Hungarian people crying out for freedom and nobody able to come to their, to their aid without the thought of a third world war, I thought, I no, I can't become the total pacifist. I'd like to be. Mm. But as my mother said when I wanted to be a pacifist at the beginning of the war, she says, what will the neighbors say? Do you get on with people? Yeah, like House of Fire. What about your family? Are you, are you an, uh, an easy to live with husband and well, father? I, I, I don't know. Uh, they sometimes seem to talk of me in, with a mild touch of terror, saying, oh, he's in a bad mood again. But then, it's a bad mood of something that's it's only being human, isn't it? No. Well, it's something to be aware of, isn't it? If, if, yeah. if, if that is part of your relationship here. Do people well, wander I, around the house on eggshells worrying about well, disturbing I, you? Well, I don't like noise. I mean, I have a daughter here, if I let her do it, would have quadraphonic sound thundering out the windows into the streets and up to the very floor of my room. So I have to put her down in the cellar and bought a machine with the headphone on. It's cost me. But have you got a number of close personal acquaintances outside your family, I mean, re really close friends that, that are important to you. Do you know, I only had one close friend, he was Harry Edgington in the, in the army, but he took exception to the books I wrote about the army and just dropped me for dead, just uh, doesn't talk to me. That hurt me terribly because one thing in the world I wanted was a long-lasting friendship, just like I wanted a long-lasting marriage. Just like I wanted to live in one house all my life, the house I was born in. I'm very great a nostalgia freak. I don't know what this yearning is for, for anchorage in my life, but I, I, no, I don't have any very long term friends. As I go. Do you think you're too demanding on people? No, I didn't make any demands of him, you know, ever. I do not. I don't know. Do I know? wish I could see others. Like Wasn't there a problem with uh, Peter Sellers, too? Wasn't there a, a break in relationship there? No, never. I was never very close to Peter Sellers. Yeah. Never very close to him, except on a professional level. I, when we talked, it was usually comedy we talked about. And he was great at comedy. And uh, our phone yeah. calls were sheer hysteria between mm. ourselves. It was quite wonderful. Mm. Do you think we don't make comedians like we used to? Uh, oh, I don't think there'll be another Tommy Cooper. I, there's nobody quite, I think he was, the giant of comedy for me in this country. He just could not do anything without making me laugh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he, even his ending, which I thought that was a strange ending, when he died on stage, you know, I was still laughing and I thought, well, you know, well, this mad ending of him dying and then discovering that he actually had died, you know, I thought, oh God, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. What's the most important of the causes that you're waving a flag for at the moment? 
Well, it's population concern. That's the cause which I'm most concerned about. I'm concerned about, you know, uh, the birth of people, starving people, conceiving while they're starving, giving birth to starving children. And I can't understand why people can't see the importance of stopping that. How would you stop it? With contraceptives, for God's sake. What would you do? Force sterility? You can you? say that. I wouldn't enforce the sterility. You can tie up a bit here and there until they get better. I believe you can re reverse a vasectomy. But you think that vasectomy should be compulsory in certain situations? Isn't it? F yes. Uh, I know you're giving me a leading question, and it's a very sensitive one, but I'm not going to be sensitive in answering it. I'm going to say desperate circumstances demand desperate measures. Nobody wants to chop a man's leg off, but if it's going to save his life, you have to chop the bloody thing off, and that's the truth of the matter. And if we have to say to people, you're not going to have children, you're not going to give birth to starving children because it's bloody criminal, right? If you don't understand it, we're going to do it to you. And that's how I do it. And this is not being a dictator, this is being a compassionate Christian. Mm. Though people don't like that. No. Are you obsessive about lots of things, or just large issues? Well, issues, issues that are world-shaking, like overpopulation, which seems to be just temporalized by anybody else. Nobody thinks about it at all. Mm. What I'm trying to get at, Spike, though, is how much of this is inherent in the topic and how much of it is in you? you know, is it important to you that the things be neat in your house and things be run in a, in a proper way? Yes. I think I always wanted to be civilized. I was Do you brought arrange up the pencils on your desk? In the, uh, Not in particularly, order. no. They're in a drawer very rough. No, it's just that a room should look nice and clean and tidy and receptive and beautiful. Now, that's, isn't that what we're all about? Is that what the whole evolution of man is, to, to improve himself? That's what we're trying to climb out of the gutter? Propriety is important to you, is it? Getting things right. In later life, it's being civilised has been very nice. Being very civilised, doing the right things, having the right knives and forks at the table. It's like you, you, I think whatever you and I do about it today, you're going to be remembered as a, as a clown. That's nice. Would you like to be remembered as something more important? N not really, no. I, I, I think that's the part I played most in life, as being a clown. I like that. I think that's a good title. Not a comedian, no, I could say that. Being a clown is nice. I like that. Why? Well, because it goes back to my very first appearance. Just fortuitously, one Christmas, the nuns realized that in the nativity scene, they couldn't change the scenery quick enough. So they grabbed hold of me, the little boy of five, and they blacked me up, put white lips on me like this, and put a pirouette costume on me with the pom-poms down here. And I had to go out, and they said, go out there and, and be funny. Unscripted. So I went out, and I was funny. And I heard this laughter coming. So that's what I was. I said, the first part I played was a clown, and the nice part of it was, then Mother Superior said to me, you, but you mustn't go on in the nativity scene. And even though I was only five, I thought, I thought that's wrong. So I went on at the nativity, and I took my hat off, and they all applauded. That was nice, wasn't it? Yeah. So I don't mind being remembered for being a clown. You've been through a lot of experiences in your life, and you've obviously acquired a lot of wisdom. If you were to be run over by a bus tomorrow, what would you like your last words to be? Thank God I'm wearing clean underwear. <laughs>